into a new part of our study in love and from this point in CE onwardly over the next few weeks we're going to work our way from topic to topic we're still going to be in love but from topic to topic such as love in the law love in the neighbor love in the Old Testament the law of love and in doing this we're going to end up covering most of the love texts in the New Testament many of which we've already earlier mentioned but we'll end up covering them again tonight I want to start with the concept of neighbor love we're not going to get through but we're going to introduce the subject Jesus teaching on neighbor love we'll find how so many and I've already set this forth before how so many of the passages on love in the New Testament fit in certain categories there are many that speak of neighbor love there are many that speak of love as the fulfilling or the fulfillment of the law there are many that speak of loving yourself love your neighbor as thyself part of the neighbor love passages but there's another aspect of love there's the concept of love versus hate uh, for one's enemy there's love in the Christian brotherhood and all different types where love passages the references to love will fit under a certain category and it generally won't be a single passage many passages will speak to that same issue so tonight Jesus teaching on neighbor love now this teaching goes back to an old sermon on the mountain tape that we did on Matthew 5:43 tape number 31 that was taught on January the 1st of 1982 which was four and a half years ago so we have we have discussed this subject and this topic earlier but it's been four and a half years ago that sermon tape number 31 on Matthew 5:43. this concept neighbor love concept is found in the following places in the New Testament Matthew 5.43 is where it begins, and that's the place from which we have dealt with it earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 19.19 19 and 22.39. Mark 12.31 and 33. Luke 10.27. Romans 13.9. Galatians 5.14 and James 2.8. So you can see how many times and how broad the expanse is from the beginning to the end of the New Testament, from Matthew to James, you have the concept of neighbor love. Now we've already dealt with the words phileo and agapao. Not always will I make reference to what term we're, we are discussing, what the term is behind a passage, but obviously you already should know almost all the time <clears throat> almost all the time it'll be an agapao term 320 to 95 in the New Testament so just about everywhere we go such as in Matthew 5 we're going to be talking about the agapao terms and not the phileo ones the phileo ones generally mean brotherly love and the agapao ones just are translated love but they're love in a higher sense now well after saying that and before going on we might want to turn over to first Thessalonians I don't think I well, I've given you this verse. We read it just to find the phileo term, Philadelphia. But I didn't make a connection I wanted to make earlier, and I'll start off by making now. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. <clears throat> Is there any difference between phileo and agapao as they're used in the New Testament? Yes, there seems to be a difference some of the time. Other times, it seems like they are used synonymously. If they're used synonymously, it's only because in Christian brother-to-brother -brother love, God expects that love to be of the highest form and highest nature, which is agapao, according to the Greek usage. Here is the best case in the New Testament where the words almost appear to, to be synonymous. But as touching Philadelphia, a phileo term, as touching brotherly love, Ye need not that I write unto you. Why shouldn't I write unto you about brotherly love? Because you've already been taught how to love by God. And now we go to an agapao term, as though the terms are used as synonyms of one another. Now, now you could argue another 
train of thought. I don't think this is as true as what I've just said, but here's a second possible solution to how these terms are used. As touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, because I'm not too concerned about brotherly love. Philadelphia, Philadelphia. What I'm really concerned about is agapao love. And so, you don't need that I write to you about this lower form of brotherly love because you are taught agapao love by God. You see how that could be an interpretation of this. That to me does not seem to be the best though because of the way it goes on to say, for ye yourselves are taught of God to practice agapao, that's brotherly love because it's love of one another who are brothers in the Christian church. So when you say agapao one another, and the one another would be Christians in the church, then that's brother to brother love, then that's Philadelphia brotherly love. Therefore, because he ends by saying not just love, but to love one another, and what he's talking about here is not love of God, but brotherly love, having love for one another, I think it's my opinion that the words are used as synonyms here. As touching brotherly love, Philadelphia, you need not that I write unto you, for yourselves are taught how to Philadelphia. Now he uses agapao. He still means Philadelphia, to have love among yourselves. For ye are taught of God to Philadelphia or to agapao one another. Okay, that's the best verse in the New Testament that shows that those words can be used as synonyms. Consequently, uh, if we jump to a passage like Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1, when we read something like this, one of those 95 times in the Christian church context and sense where a phileo term is found, my argument is we are not to think, unless the context dictates otherwise, we are not to think of that as a less form of love than agapao love. Let brotherly love continue. But does he mean to let any type of love continue besides that that's active, that's self-sacrificial, and that's giving? Is he talking about a different type of love than that? I don't think so. When he says let brotherly love continue, I don't think he means let that love that's kind of selfish and sometimes lazy and doesn't give that much, let this continue in your midst. Well, that's not love then. Not love in the New Testament Christian sense. What type of love is he talking about when... The apostle writes, let brotherly love. He's talking about love that's active, that's self-sacrificial, that's giving. Hey, that's our definition behind the concept of the agapao terms, not the phileo terms. But our point is, if they are the same and they seem to be in a case like this, then we're not to think of different meanings. It's just that a different word has been picked. And we just know of multitudes of examples in our own, in our own language where different words that maybe originally had a different meaning and that in certain contexts still have a different meaning can in other contexts be used synonymously of one another. So let's try not to just think of a, a, a huge wholesale distinction that's found between the phileo and the agapao terms. Sometimes like in what, Romans chapter 12, I believe, uh, verse 10, you find different types of love terms that are found together. But I still think it would, be, it would be pressing the issue too far to say now here is the meaning of phileo and he exhorts you to have that and then moreover he exhorts you to go beyond that and go to agapao. I feel that if it's, if it's phileo in the Christian sense then phileo love is the same as agapao love. It's active, it's self-sacrificial, and it's giving. Okay, so we've just given you the nine times, the only nine times, where the concept of neighbor love appears in the pages of the New Testament. All nine of these point back to Leviticus 19.18. We'll take a look at that later. One writer said, and I quote, a Christian can be defined as a person who loves. There's the definition of a Christian. Well, it's, of course, just a partial one. A Christian is a person who loves. Carl Henry said that love is the distinctive feature of Christian ethics. And he reasons as follows, because our Christian ethics is an evangelistic ethics, and reaching people means love. 
Henry said that love is a distinctive feature of Christian ethics because ours is an evangelistic ethics and reaching people. Evangelistic, reaching people means love. Now here's what we're going to do with these nine passages. Number one, we will deal with the setting of Matthew 5.43 in a later message. Now the setting is Sermon on the Mount. I don't mean that type of setting. I mean the setting where he says, Ye have heard it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, but I say unto you. That type of setting. We're going to deal with the setting of Matthew 5.43, not tonight, but in a later message. Then number two, three of those nine passages deal with the law. Romans 13, 9, Galatians 5, 14, and James 2, 8. And we will deal with that concept in a later message. You see, it'll be in the context like uh, love is the fulfilling of the law because he said, love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay, there we have the love of neighbor, the love of self, and love as a fulfilling of the law, all three of those concepts that we're going to kind of break up and study, all three of those concepts found in the same verse, or if not in the same verse, two verses in the same passage together. So we just have to pick under which of those three are we going to discuss that passage where it's found. For instance, turn over to Romans chapter 13 and verse 9, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. That it's love of neighbor here, but it's found more than of love of neighbor, it's found in the law context. And so we're going to deal with it more with law. Romans uh, 13, 9. All of these commandments, all of these commandments of verse 9 are briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's neighbor love. But look what he said in the end of verse 8. He that loveth another, well, that's still neighbor love, but it doesn't say neighbor, hath fulfilled the law, law, law. Verse 10, therefore love is a fulfilling of the law, law, law. So the context here is speaking of law. In uh, Galatians 5.14, you'll get familiar with all these passages. There are not that many, by the way, in the New Testament. We can jump back and forth in our mind. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's that quote. It's found nine times. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Nine times in the New Testament. But here it's found in the context of law and liberty. James 2.8, another place where it speaks of love of neighbor. But it says, if ye fulfill the royal law. So it's law context again. James 2.8, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, and here's the quote, thou shalt love thy neighbor, Leviticus 19.18, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We find neighbor concept of love, no doubt about that. We'll deal with it under law, though. Then number three, Matthew 19.19. 19. That's one of the nine places I gave you. I'm telling you what we're going to do with those nine. We're going to reduce it to just studying a couple of these, really just one tonight, because the others fit under other places. Matthew 19:19 19, 19 is the same account as in Mark 10. But in Mark 10, it omits the neighbor reference. Now Mark 10, remember, is uh, the great commandment, this business. So since Matthew 19:19 19, 19 is the same account as Mark 10, I'll show this to you. If you look at Matthew 19 and you look at Mark 10, we're talking about the same account. It's just that Mark leaves out one phrase of, of what Jesus said. Saith unto him, which Jesus said, you know, what shall I do to enter life? Keep the commandments. He lists the commandments. And he ends in verse 19 by saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, in um, Mark chapter 10, uh, he doesn't give us this. Mark 10, verse 19. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not kill, commit adultery, steal, honor your father and your mother, and so forth. And why doesn't he? He doesn't. 
in there in Mark 10, 19, like he does in Matthew 19, 19, by saying, and love your neighbor as yourself. But since they are the exact same account in Jesus' ministry, we'll deal with that with the other account. That leaves us then with Matthew 22 and Mark 12, which are the same account. So we only have one passage to deal with, one concept. Matthew 22 and Mark 12, the same account, and it's given to us in Jesus' words. Now, if you go back in that list of nine passages, which one have I not mentioned? See if you're staying up with me. Luke 10 is the only one we haven't mentioned then. Luke 10 is very similar to Matthew 22 and Mark 12. It's similar, but it's different. It's not the same account. And what is so interesting about it is that it gives us the words of the lawyer and not the words of Jesus. Now, the only way I know to go about this is the way that we're doing it, and it takes a little time. But first of all, we're going to have to familiarize ourselves with some of these passages. Matthew 22, verse 39. Along with Mark 12, verse 31. Now, the account is the same. Matthew and Mark are representing and reproducing the same account. A lawyer, verse 35, comes asking him a question, tempting him, saying, what's the great commandment? He said, love God. Then verse 39, the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The words of Jesus. Mark 12 man comes to him in verse 28 and says, what's the first commandment? Jesus said, love God. Then verse 31, the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay, Matthew 22 and Mark 12, they wouldn't have to be, but I'm just letting you know that they are the same account in Jesus' ministry, and in both we have the words of Jesus. Now, 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 Luke 10, verses 25 to 27. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, What's written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, You got a red letter. Notice it's not in red letters. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now the accounts are very similar. The same question is asked. The same answer is given, but they differ in that in the Matthew and Mark account, Jesus provides the answer of dividing the law up into two principles, love of God and love of neighbor, and on these two hang the law and the prophets. That differs from Luke 10, same question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now Jesus turns it around to this man. He called a lawyer here like he was, unlike what he was in Mark 12, although it's the same man, but like he was in Matthew chapter 22. But now the man responds, oh, what is the law? I can divide it up into two parts, love of God and love of neighbor. Now, here's the question, why are they the same? Have you ever noticed that? That in one place Jesus gives the answer as though it was original with him. The other place he asked this lawyer, and this lawyer gave him the answer. It's the same answer that Jesus gave. Why are they the same? Wasn't Jesus the first one to come up with this summary? If not, from whom or where did he obtain it then? And if so, then did the lawyer earlier hear Christ's teachings? And therefore he's repeating what he heard Jesus earlier say to another lawyer in the Matthew 22 and Mark 12 account? Well, it's an interesting question. It's remarkable that the responses are identically the same. It's highly unlikely that we have different sources. I mean, look at the response. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The same four words that Mark uses in Mark 12. And love your neighbor as yourself. 
we almost have to agree to begin with on the point that we must have a common source of origin for this summation of the law in its two aspects, love of God and love of neighbor. Now, if we have a common source of origin and we know that Jesus said it, that almost would incline us to believe that Jesus was the source of origin and that the man must have earlier heard Jesus' teachings and therefore he's repeating what he heard Jesus say. However, that's unlikely for why ask the question when he heard the question asked earlier and he heard the answer given earlier as well. And moreover, Luke 10 in the narrative of Jesus' life may come earlier than Matthew 22 and Mark 12, which means that he could not have heard what Jesus said in Matthew 22 and Mark 12, which could then only mean if we're still going to assume he heard it from Jesus, Jesus gave this little, this little, con this little situation of what's the greatest commandment here in three different places. One time prior to Luke 10, then in Luke 10, brought up by this lawyer, then in Matthew 22 and Mark 12, which is the same account. That's part of the problem of this remarkable similarity between these statements. Now, even if we were to assume, and we can't, but even if we were to assume that Luke 10 is the same account as Matthew 22 and Mark 12, it's just impossible because the answer to the question is given by the lawyer and not by Jesus. Now, of course, what the school of higher criticism will say is that one of these authors is confused. Matthew and Mark thought that Jesus gave the answer and Luke, he remembers getting the story correct and his story said that Jesus asked the man for the answer when the lawyer gives the answer. And so either Matthew, Mark, or Luke, either the Matthew, Mark account or Luke is confused about the answer. Of course, that would mean that the scriptures are not inerrant or infallible. All right, let's start looking at some answers to this situation. That's what we have to do to begin with because it will give us a better background to this whole concept of neighbor love. It seems unlikely that we can trace this statement originally to Jesus himself because this lawyer has not had the opportunity to have gained it from Jesus. Probably not. Probably not. The statements are given almost identically the same. And that generally points toward a common source of origin. So evidently over the years, I'm speaking of the Old Testament years, God had finally brought Israel to the point of understanding with the mind at least that the essence of their religion was revealed love. You'll remember back in the giving of the law, God began with great stress on the cult of Israel, the sacrifice that was required, the ritual of the priestly liturgy and the service as found in Exodus chapter 23 through Numbers chapter 29. Eventually in Israel it got to the place where the, the common Jew was substituting outward ceremonies, the outward performance of these various duties, was substituting outward ceremonies for the inner commandments and requirements that he knew had been placed upon him. We see that, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 1. So that, finally, by the end of Old Testament era and Old Testament days, just like with Samuel the prophet earlier in 1 Samuel 15:22. The latter prophets came preaching not liturgy, but morality. For instance, Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 23. Hosea 6.6. 6. God desires mercy and not sacrifice. Micah 6.6-8, 6, 6 the famous passage, What does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. So it appears that it was a process over a process of time that a gradual work had been done, at least superficially, at least in the minds of the people, so that they had finally come to the place they understood with the mind that the essence of their religion was the subject of revealed love. You remember back whenever the law was given. Most of the Jews at that time, and God intended it for this purpose and intended for them to see it in this way, 
most of the Jews only saw the externals. God has come down. God has given us a law. God has given us commandments. He wrote them with his own finger on the tablets of stone. He has given us Aaron and his sons as priests. He has given us the Levites as ministers. He has established the tabernacle here with the giving of the law and all of the requirements and the specifications for it to be built. And God wants us to worship him through sacrifice, through the various things that he's ordained that we should do. Well, that was true at that time. God had to stress that so strongly to the point almost, not totally, Leviticus 19.18 is still there, love thy neighbor as thyself. But he had to stress it almost totally to do what I tell you to do in these external outward forms. So what does Israel start doing? She starts complying doing that, obeying the law, obeying the sacrifices, serving God at the tabernacle, later serving God at the temple. But we know eventually she gets to the place where she substitutes all of that for internal morality. According to Isaiah chapter 1, she has become a nation of legalists. That if I do these externals that God said to do, then he has no claim, no requirements upon my life anymore. And so what happens then? You have to see that there's an emphasis Ship. We've done it right here in this church, and it always has to take place. And you're always finding the critics that say, now the later prophets, whenever they came on the scene, the late ones after the time of the early ones like Moses and so forth, they came preaching another gospel. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 7 and verse 23, whenever I brought you out of the land of Israel, I spake nothing unto thy fathers concerning sacrifice. Well, the whole Pentateuch is about what God spake about sacrifice whenever he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So what do you mean when I brought you out? I spake nothing to your fathers about sacrifice. Well, you know, when you say something that strongly, either you mean it in the absolute sense or it's hyperbole. It's a figure of speech. You're speaking that strongly to emphasize a point. I spake nothing to your fathers about sacrifice. What he means is I spake nothing about sacrifice in comparison to the other things I said, not as often, like Leviticus 19.18, love thy neighbor as thyself, Deuteronomy 6, 4, love the Lord your God, hear him, follow him. I spake nothing as strongly as that. And so they have to come emphasizing what to the higher school of the higher critics is another gospel. And they seem to forget that the earlier prophets had the same message. 1 Samuel 15, 22, what does the Lord delight in? Does he delight in these sacrifices? Or is it obedience? Oh, he said, to obey the Lord is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is like idolatry. Now, that was one of the earlier prophets, 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. He came preaching, he was an earlier prophet, the message of the later, the latter prophets, that God is mostly concerned about morality. He was mostly concerned about morality in the day of Moses as well. It's just that he had a point to emphasize. He wanted to emphasize morality and spirituality through the carnal ordinances that were instituted on Mount Sinai. They didn't understand that then. Whenever the later prophets come on the scene, we've seen that they have fallen totally into the externals of their religion, and they came preaching against that. God's not concerned about that. In our teaching in the intertestamental period earlier this evening, we looked in Jeremiah chapter 7. God said, don't trust in lying words, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It's going to be destroyed. All the externals are going to pass away. But it's what? Execute judgment and righteousness with your neighbor. Judge correctly the widow, the fatherless. Relieve the oppressed and the poor. You see, it's all on morality. It's not the externals of religion. It's all on the internals of morality there. My point in saying all this is when we look at the statement that the lawyer gives to Jesus in, in Luke 10 and verse 27, apparently God has finally brought them to the place through all of the years of the latter prophets, through the period between the testaments, he's finally brought them to the place where at least with their mind, they recognize that the essence of their religion is a moral essence, an ethical essence, and it's internal, not external. He asked Jesus a question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, a good rabbi might say, 
many of the rabbis in his day would have said, well, pay your tithes, pay your offerings, pay your half shekel temple tax, observe the rituals, come to your, your regular attendance, either at synagogue, if you're in a faraway land, or to the temple or another synagogue, if you're in Jerusalem, and would have put all the emphasis on externals. He asked a question and Jesus said, what's written in the law? How do you read? And the man doesn't give any of the current common answers of pay your tax, do your religious duty. He says, love God, love your neighbor. Gave the right answer. From where, our question is, from where did he get such an answer? You could say, well, the Old Testament. Jesus asked him the question, how do you read the law? That's right, but why didn't they ever read it that way in the Old Testament? What should we do to inherit eternal life in the Old Testament? The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord would have been their answer. Instead of love, forget the temple. God doesn't dwell in buildings made with men's hands anyway. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor and God will prosper you and you won't go into Babylonian captivity then. They didn't have that answer then. He's gradually brought them to this place. That doesn't mean, however, that all of their externals have totally been done away with in their mind. For instance, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. For the continuation of That doesn't mean, however, that all of their externals have totally been done away with in their mind. For instance, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. We have the ridiculous situation that at this time they're caught up in two sides of the same coin. They're caught up in believing that the ritual, many of the people are caught up in believing that the ritual is what will get you in. And at the same time, at least in their mind, they're willing to admit our religion consists in other things besides the externals. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. You're caught up in the externals. You have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, not to leave the others undone. Although Jesus mentions both, he obviously puts the emphasis on the internals and not the externals. So by the New Testament days, they at least saw both sides of the coin and to some extent were trying to practice them. That can only mean, here's our conclusion if you haven't followed, followed all of this discourse yet, that can only mean that this statement given in Matthew 22 and Mark 12 by Jesus did not come from him originally. Now, again, we come to one of these many and remarkable aspects of the Gospels where we need to have, in order to understand them, extra biblical information, other information about the rabbis, their writings, the times and peoples and concepts of the land of Palestine. I would go so far as to say, I would venture to say that every one of us here thought Jesus made that up. It sounds so beautiful. When someone came to him and said, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself because on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Didn't you think that he just, he's God from heaven. He summed up the whole Old Testament law. He was such a wise teacher. Well, you know we're not taking any credit away from our Lord and Savior at all, but we are trying to state what the fact of the matter was. That was not original with him. The problem with it being original is Luke 10, 27. How did this lawyer get the identical same answer? Luke 10 may definitely come earlier than Matthew 22 and Mark 12. So he didn't get it from Jesus saying those two accounts. You would have to assume he said it three times, as I said earlier. And one of those came prior to Luke 10. But then why go through the whole thing again if he already knows the answer? And he's already heard someone come to Jesus and ask him this before. Makes no sense at all. Yes, we've got a common source of origin for this phrase, this statement, but it's not Jesus. Who is it? Well, obviously, it's the Jewish rabbis who are living in the first century A.D. Some have come earlier. Some have said things very similar that came quite a bit earlier. 
this had become an understood precept in the Jews' religion by the first half of the first century A.D. You see, so many of these things, so many of these things, Jesus said, and this is what shakes the faith of the hyper-conservative out there. He just will not admit to these things. But this is what is so important. We're coming to the same topic again. That so many of the statements and the teachings of Jesus were patterned identically after the teaching of the rabbis, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. The, the New Testament could have hidden that fact by not repeating these things. God could have hidden those facts by making sure that we don't have any extra biblical extant material that records these things that came prior to Jesus' teaching. And both the New Testament and God, they chose not to hide those things, as though there's nothing wrong with knowing that Jesus didn't think that statement up originally, love God, love your neighbor. Whew, I summed up the whole Old Testament. But that didn't come with him originally. What the New Testament does strive to state very clearly is the people recognize Jesus, although he might have borrowed many things from the scribes, Jesus taught as one having authority Matthew 7, and not like the scribes. It didn't say that they didn't teach the same thing. Jesus practiced what he preached. The scribes didn't. That gave him authority with what he said. The people recognize that. Here's a man who does what he says. Be a friend. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be a friend to these people. What is Jesus? He is a man who is a friend with publicans and sinners. Now, that must be true morality. The scribes, oh, I don't want to taint myself ceremonially by getting within 10 yards of a harlot or a prostitute or a publican or a sinner. Well, how are you ever going to convert them to the kingdom of God then? Jesus went in their midst and converted them. Zacchaeus was one, Luke 19. We looked at that earlier in ITP and converted them to the kingdom of God. So according to the last two verses of Matthew chapter 7, the distinction between Jesus and the scribes, among other things, one, he's God and they are men. I don't mean that distinction, but the distinction was not that he had any different teaching that, than they had. It was in some aspects, but it was that he practiced what he preached and that gave him authority with what he said. And the common man recognized that. And you can recognize that in people. You can recognize when someone has a flowery tongue, but they're saying things that are not real to them. They're teaching things that are not a part of their life. And it may sound flowery, but there's no authority with what's being said. And Jesus may come borrowing some of the flowery speech of the rabbis. Love God with all your heart, your neighbor as yourself. I wish I would have invented that. You can make a million on logos in the back of cars with a statement like that, you know. So you might want to borrow someone else's beautiful statement, but you're living that, though. He does love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, his Father in heaven. And he does love his neighbor as himself. And the scribe didn't. He didn't love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, or he would have obeyed God. And he didn't love his neighbor, as we'll see here in Luke 10, or he would have helped him when he had a need. And Jesus helped people when he saw that they had a need. So there's a difference. We go back to, if you want to go back to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. I've given you the statistics on this before, and I'm going to give you the statistics on this love God and love neighbor concept in just a moment as well. The golden rule, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. That's found in its negative form, the reverse. Whatever you don't want men to do to you, then don't do to them. That's found in the Apocrypha. That was a current statement in Jewish rabbinical circles of Jesus' day. And notice how he goes on to say, on this do the law and the prophets hang. This is the law and the prophets. Very similar, very similar to chapter 22 when he says, love God, love your neighbor. For what? This is the law and the prophets. On um, these two things hang the law and the prophets. Now, he's got the same conclusion here in Matthew 7. We've given you those statistics earlier. So, tonight, let me give you some of these statistics for this love of God, love of neighbor concept in proving that did, it, did not originate with Jesus. First of all, first of all, we have Simon the Just. I won't embarrass you or sadden me by asking, do you remember that man? But we did discuss him in ITP. Simon the Just, 3rd century B.C. He said the, f the following. The world rests 
upon three things. The law, love, and divine service. The world rests upon three things. <clears throat> the law, love, and divine service. Now this man saw that one of the foundations to our existence was revealed love. That his religion had to be a religion of love. Now whether he practiced it would be another matter. We're saying that at least mentally they had this concept by the time of the New Testament. Okay, even more importantly than that, we have a statement from Hillel. H-I-L-L-E-L, -L -E -L, Hillel, who came just before Christ. Now we're getting to contemporary times for also a statement very similar, just like in the Apocrypha, and very similar to Matthew 7, 12. And I quote from him as well. Hillel said, Do not unto thy neighbor what is hateful unto thee. Jesus just turned it around and gave us the positive. Instead of the negative, don't, 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 but do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But that didn't originate with him. Hillel said, do not unto thy neighbor, love thy neighbor as thyself. We're talking about neighbor love. Do not unto thy neighbor what is hateful unto thee. This is the whole law, and all the rest is commentary. Now, you wish you had invented that statement, too. What a beautiful way to say it. In other words, what he's saying is the whole law, and he was speaking here in the context of <clears throat> personal relationships, or he probably would have included something about love of God. The whole law is not loving your neighbor. It's first of all loving God and then your neighbor. But in the context of personal relationships, he said the whole law is love your neighbor, and everything else you could say is just commentary. He means everything else you could say is commentary upon the fact that you must, according to God's law, love your neighbor. And all the other things you could say is a commentary on that precept of, for them, the Jewish religion, for us, the Christian religion. Well, so notice that Jesus didn't originate this, this little statement about love being so important. Of somehow, in other words, seeing the law, seeing the summation of the law as love. He didn't see the summation of the law as love for the first time. Someone else saw that prior to him. So there's another example of how this has been seen earlier. Then another example is back in Mark chapter 12. I'll have to show you where we see this. In Mark chapter 12, another example that proves to us this was not an original statement with him. In verses 32 through 34, this man, one of the scribes, this man agreed with Jesus' statement from his heart, not as though he had heard something brand new for the first time, but it was just uh, a, a further confirmation of what he knew to have been said by rabbis who no doubt were alive in his day. You see, Jesus gives this beautiful answer. Love God, verse 30. Love your neighbor, verse 31. The scribe said unto him, Oh, thou hast said the truth. There is one God, and there is none other but he. That's verse 29. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, do you think that he just got convinced of all this truth and was able to repeat it so precisely just on the basis of what he had just heard Jesus say? That's highly unlikely. This was a rabbi, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who was teaching what some other rabbis had taught, the same thing, love God, love your neighbor. This is the whole law and the business of other things such as sacrifices. All the rest of that's just commentary. That'd be a commentary on the love of God law, kindness, long-suffering, those are just, that's insignificant. That's commentary on the law of love your neighbor. When Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any 
question. Not because they had never heard a statement like this before. That's, I think that's a popular view whenever you read over this. Wow, they've never heard it. They had heard that statement. They had never heard a one say it like he could say it. There are differences in saying things. You say it from your life's experience, from your heart, and you say it because you heard someone else say it. God had brought the people mentally to accepting the fact that love of God and love of neighbor was the whole thing about the Old Testament law. All the law and the prophets are built upon that one thing, love God and love your neighbor. The one thing is love, two aspects of God and of your neighbor. They'd come to that mentally. They'd come to grips with that and to agree with that mentally. And so one rabbi would make this statement, another rabbi would pick it up, and that sounds good, and he agreed with that in his mind. Now, did he live it? Did he practice it? Nobody's practicing it. Very few people are practicing it. The religious leaders who come along are not practicing it. Look at Paul, or Saul, we should say. Saul's a faithful rabbi. He's a murderer at the same time. He doesn't love his neighbor. His Christian, this new sect that's arisen called the Way, his Christian neighbor, did Saul love him? Saul was well-versed in the law, but he was missing what the rabbis taught. <laughs> More important than being well-versed is do you know the simple message of the law? Love God and love your neighbor. And he proved he didn't know that by murdering his neighbor. How can you love him and kill him? No man who murders his neighbor loves his neighbor. Saul's violating that. See, very few people are practicing that. Jesus Christ comes along, and he is one who practices it. That's what caught people's attention. He was a friend to those who needed a friend. He said, I didn't come to be friends with those who already have friends. I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. That's found in Matthew 9 in the context of eating at a feast evidently held by Levi and eating in the midst of so-called publicans and sinners. And all insults were thrown at him for meeting with such lowly people. He said, but the rest of you people don't have a need. They thought they didn't have a need. Why fellowship with the Pharisees? Why fellowship with the high priest? Can you convert a high priest? That's highly unlikely. You can convert one of those dumb sheep being led astray by the high priest called a publican and sinner. Called a sinner. The high priest is a sinner as well. But the notorious sinners, the harlots, as Jesus makes reference to, those would be the ones I came to save because those are the ones that listen to what I have to say Amen. and be converted. Well, we've got an interesting situation here then where this man is comprehending what he said, not just because Jesus said it, but he's heard it before. So there's a third reference, in my mind anyway, Simon the Just, Hillel, the man in Mark 12, in the way that he gives the answer, 32 through 34, and how Jesus responds to show this was current. And then finally, we have Luke 10, 27, the lawyer's words. Now, there are four references, four, we could say, pre well, although the man in Mark 12 comes after Jesus' statement, he evidently had heard it earlier, four references that come earlier than the Matthew 22 and Mark 12, the same account given in Jesus' words. Now, here in Luke 10, he asked the question, Jesus said, you've read the law, how do you read it? This man wasn't so wise that he was able to come up with that statement. Don't fool yourself with that. How do you read it? Well, he reads it as he's heard some of the rabbis say. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole law. Then later on, now we're moving past references that would substantiate my contention for you this evening, and that is that that statement was not original with Jesus. Uh, he's the one who gives it new meaning and authority and so forth because he's the one who came and lived it and showed us how to practice it. But moving beyond that, later in the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, the Didache. The Didache begins by describing what the way of life, capital L-I-F-E, capital W-A-Y, the way of life, what the way of life is like. The Didache, and it states the following. First of all, thou shalt love the Lord thy God who made thee. Secondly, thy neighbor as thyself. Now, of course, you can't argue that the Didache picked it up from Hillel or Simon the Just. The Didache evidently got it from the teachings of Jesus. But we have to go earlier than the teachings of Jesus, is my point. 
First of all, thou shalt love the Lord thy God who made thee. Secondly, thy neighbor as thyself. And whatsoever thou wouldst not have done to thyself, do not thou to another. Same as Hillel said just prior to the time of Christ, same as what Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. And whatsoever thou wouldst not to have done to thyself, do not to another. Okay, let's start looking at Luke 10 passage then. Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. The odds are against the lawyer copying this from Jesus. It does appear definite that such understanding of the law was current by the time of Christ. At least lip service agreement was paid to the thought that the moral life as led by love was far superior to the, uh, the, the external cultic rites of the Old Testament. But now we come to the catch of it all here in this passage. They knew to love their neighbor. But the question in this context from him then becomes, but who is my neighbor? The lawyer answered correctly in Luke 10. There's no doubt about the correctness of his answer. He answers correctly. But in verses 28 and 29, we find him caught. Caught because his conscience spoke to him of the fact that he in practice did not love all men as he should. See, he gives us the statement of his mind in verse 27 in answering his own question. Really, he answers his own question as well as Jesus' question. His question of 25, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' question, to answer his question, he asks a question, what's written in the law? How do you read? He answers it correctly. There's no doubt about that. Love God, love your neighbor. And Jesus said to him, thou hast answered right. Now, if we want to know whether he gave the right answer, Jesus said that he did. This do and thou shalt live. Now, we might then ask ourselves the question, well, then why did he ask the question since he already knew the answer? That goes against a statement that I made earlier that if he already had heard Jesus say this, he's not going to come and ask him the question when he already knows the answer. Well, maybe not in that sense, but in this sense, he already knows the answer. He couldn't have given it. So why ask the question? The question in his mind must really not be, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He knows the answer. Love God and love your neighbor. The question is, who is my neighbor? His own conscience must have convicted him that although he had this in his mind, verse 27, when Jesus went on to say, this do and thou shalt live, this what? This believe and thou shalt live? This what? This do and thou shalt live. That all of a sudden... He comes to full grips with the fact, I believe it, but I don't do it. And so we read to justify himself. He asks the question, who is my neighbor? And in asking the question, who is my neighbor? Obviously, he hopes that Jesus will define neighbor in such a way that it will not include those people that he either does not want to love or for some other reason has chosen not to love. He's hoping that when Jesus answers the question, who is my neighbor, he's going to define it narrowly. Jesus defines it very broadly here. Jesus really answers another question, not who is my neighbor, but whose neighbor am I, as we'll see when we get to the end of the passage here. But we read here in verse 29, but he willing to justify himself. He's got the right answer. He must be practicing it to certain types of people. So his question is not, what must I do, but to whom should I do it? This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and here's a question of the ages, and who is my neighbor? Now, Cain asks this question very early in history in another form. Am I my brother's keeper? You remember that in Genesis 4? He killed his brother, and God says, Where is Abel? Well, I don't know. I'm not his babysitter. Am I expecting to watch after him? Genesis 4, the same question as this man is asking. It was a question in interpersonal relationships. It was a question of morality for the Old Testament. Am I my brother's keeper? 
The same thing. It's remarkable how it's repeated under a different form in the New Testament. Who is my neighbor? Who is my brother? Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, oh, the blood of thy brother Abel crieth to me from the ground. God didn't ask where is Abel out of a lack of knowledge. God knew where Abel was. It was to get Cain to face up to the fact that he had just committed the first murder. But he responds in this, in this pious fashion, am I my brother's keeper? It's repeated again, and who is my neighbor? And you see, he's hoping, he asked Jesus the question, who's my neighbor? He's hoping that he will define it so narrowly that it will include all of the men that this man likes to love. That's what he wants it to include. He doesn't want the answer to include those outside of the present confines of his love because that would mean he has to do something about his love life. So here's the answer. Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, and by the way, is this story here original with Jesus? Was probably a very common current experience. The experience found here, as far as the, the organization of the story, that appears to be original with him. But this business of a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Hey, by the way, in the intertestamental period, I think we ended about Jericho. See, we're finding it here. And to know what we know about Jericho for that study would also help us for this study as well. <laughs> Fell among thieves and stripped him of his raiment. Oh, I know where I was, by the way. I was with by chance. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, well, it was two denaria, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? He said, That's easy, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do. We're back to the do of verse 28. Go and do thou likewise. No doubt it's one of the most beautiful stories in the New Testament. So beautiful, we'll stop tonight and let you think about it, and I will teach on it later. <laughs>